this presentation is a really quick uh, walkthrough of First Day of the Year, Step 2 CK in terms of the orientation. My name is Tal Lee. I'm Assistant Clinical Professor of Allergy and Immunology at the University of Louisville. I'm also the, the Section Chief there in the uh, Department of Medicine. But of course, uh, you folks know me a little bit better as the Senior Author of First Day of the Year, Step 1 and author of many of the First Day books and also as the Senior Editor of USLayer X, our companion question bank that's also developed by the First Day authors. So the Step 2 CK is very similar to Step 1. It's an all-day exam it's structured slightly differently in the sense that it's 9 hours, there's 352 questions, you have a little less on Step 1, and they're all in one-hour blocks, and you have 44 questions per block, and you have 45 minutes of break time. And this is a simple schematic of what the exam day could look like, and also the fact that somewhere in the middle you're going to want to take a break and eat lunch or get some snacks. And we'll talk about lunch strategies a little later on. Since most of you folks have taken the Step 1, perhaps with the exception of maybe some of the IMGs who might be clustering them together. This should be pretty old hat for you guys. In terms of the interface, the interface has been pretty much the same for the last two years. This is Fred V2. It was introduced about two years ago. You know, it's very similar to the old Fred V1 in, in the sense that you have all the navigation towards the top. You've got the ability to highlight and strike out your answers. A fair chunk of the questions will have some sort of image or visual data that you'll need to interpret, and then you'll be able to track the progress in the slider bar on the left side. You can flag a question, you can mark it up, and so forth, and you'll get some signals right here. In terms of questions types, the vast majority of the questions are still one best answer items, but there are also uh, some additional types of uh, questions, including sequential item sets. Those those who took the step one last year in 2009 after the May time frame should have seen some of those. If you took it early last year, you might not have seen these. Also matching sets which have been here for many years except they were not on the step one. I'll show you examples of some of those things in a minute. A few of these questions will have multimedia items such as like heart sounds or lung sounds and so forth and you'll need to interpret that and we'll talk about how that can be done a little later on. Click on vignettes, you know, predominate on the exam, almost all the questions have some sort of vignette scenario. And like the step one, they do incorporate multiple steps of reasoning. They try to integrate multiple disciplines or organ systems. And there are going to potentially be some experimental questions. The, the board has always done that. They haven't said much about it recently, or at least in the, in the literature in the year, but in the past they have been open about saying that they do experimental questions. It's a chunk of the test. They don't tell us how much it is. If you see a question that looks just virtually impossible or just ridiculous, pray that's an experimental question. Give it your best shot and move on. In terms of the Fred V2 interface, in terms of the interface, this, for example, is an example of a matching set. And so what you'll see here is it looks a little different from the one best answer question in the sense that the answers are on top and then you have the vignette scenario at the bottom. And here what's asking you is like, you know, each patient has some issue or whatever. Here it's a headache and they're going to ask you to select the most likely diagnosis in this particular case. So they give you a vignette, you read through it, and then you're going to choose one of these. And then what happens is that when you go on to the next question, you have, again, the very same item. So this is why it's called a matching set, but you have a completely different vignette. So here, in this case, it's a 19-year-old woman. And all the choices are here, and it's possible, though, you know, less likely that it could be the same answer, but it's likely going to be different answers. The other item, as I mentioned, which was new, is the sequential item, and this was introduced in 2009. The majority of you folks hopefully should have seen it by now. It looks for all the world initially like a single best answer question. So you've got a question scenario, a vignette scenario. Here is some fellow that comes in with some flank pain and a little bit of blood in the urine and so forth, and you're asked what's the most likely diagnosis. And the key thing is here, once you select an answer and you move on to the next part of this question, it's a two-part question, you cannot go back and change your answer like on on the matching set or like some of the other question sets that you might have seen in the past. So for example, in this case, we know that, that this presentation is the most consistent with urolithiasis. You'll check that and then it's going to say, hey, this guy actually has a kidney stone. And so that basically gives you the answer right there. So of course that's why you can't go back and change the answer. Then they're going to ask you something about the management or you know maybe something about the pathophysiology and then that's going to be the next question. The last item of this equation item is that you can go back and change the answer later on if you want while you're in the test block. Once you exit the test block, of course, you will not be able to go back and change any of the answers in a test block, just like with the US Link Step 1. In terms of the things that the board is really focused on, you got to start with the end of mind. You need to know what they want you to be doing or thinking. And so, and it's going to turn out that the majority of the questions or a fair chunk is going to be about what the diagnosis is, management, 
you know, what we've seen is mention is going to be the next common thing. Mechanism disease is also very common, and then also there's a chunk devoted to preventive medicine and health maintenance. Now, this is how the U.S. only step two breaks it down, at least in their literature. But like I said, I think we see it uh, slightly different. I'm going to just jump to that. So the most common lead is that we've been seeing is that they're going to ask you about the diagnosis, and then they're going to ask you about the next most popular thing will be asking you about what the appropriate initial step in management, then followed by the second most appropriate step in management, or the next most appropriate step in management. Sometimes, well, you know, if there's a complication, what should you be doing there? What's the most likely complication, etc.? Those are other you know, related management type lead-in questions. Uh, in terms of pathophysiology, they may talk about the cause or the pathogen. And then there's going to be some questions about preventive health and maintenance as well, as I mentioned earlier. Let's talk about passing and failing here. As you recall from the step one, there are two numerical scales. They're both scaled scores, and so that means that it's not a raw number, it's not a percentile or anything like that. They calculate some of those numbers, and but then it's scaled to some sort of curve that's based on a reference group. And in this case, the three-digit passing threshold is 184, and that's been going up every three or four years, and the two-digit passing threshold is 75, and it's always been 75. And the reason why there are two scales is because in some states, the certified exam, the passing threshold was designated 75, so it's something that was actually state registered mandate as opposed to something that actually came from the NBME themselves. Most of the time when you're talking to the board folks or you're talking to the residency program directors, again, you're going to be dealing with a three-digit score, just like you are with your step one. In terms of the mean, it's been rising steadily over the years. 15 years ago or so, it was closer to 200, now it's 226. The standard deviation has increased very, very slightly over the years. It's around 23 points for one standard deviation. They don't uh, report a percentile, and again, the 75 number here, the two-digit score, is not a percentile or raw score, so remember the scaled score. If you assume a normal Gaussian distribution, you can get a rough idea of what the percentiles are by just doing your basic vital stats here. For U.S. allopathic med students, you know, almost everybody's going to pass, and eventually for osteopathic IMG students, most will pass within three tries. The numbers are a little lower, you know, at least on the first try, but most do eventually get past the exam. In terms of the score report, it looks just like your step one report. So you've got your pass-fail indicator, your three-digit scale, your score, and your two-digit score. And then the histogram showing your relative strengths and weaknesses in terms of your performance by task, disease, and conditions, categories, and discipline profiles. Okay, so this is kind of like your clerkships down here. And this is kind of more organ system based, if you will. Some of you who have attended my step one talks in the past know that you do need to think about what type of goals you have in terms of either passing the exam comfortably, beating the mean or ace the exam. And there is some relationship to in terms of where you want to end up. We'll talk about this a little bit later. For step one, there are some specialties that use your step one score as a screening tool. And to some extent, some of the programs do it for step two as well, too. That includes some of the very competitive subspecialties and also maybe some of the very competitive programs in broad specialty, like your Brigham and Women's in internal medicine, for example, can be just as competitive as any opto program out there, for example. And now we're going to dive into a little bit of how the Step 2 score jives with residency selection and career choice selection. So again, some of you guys have seen this slide in the past. This is data from the second edition of the NRMP Charting Outcomes in the Match. And again, if you've not seen this publication before, you really owe it to yourself to go to the nrmp.org, go under Publications, and get the latest edition because it's packed with data regarding characteristics and predictors of people who match in certain specialties. And this is uh, the step one scores for U.S. seniors, and so this is going to be essentially allopathic medical students who matched by their preferred specialty. And you can see that these are the very competitive, especially the road specialties that I mentioned a little earlier. So dermatology, plastics, otorgeringology, etc. And you can see that the median scores are in the 230s to the low 240s. Now you can see that interquartile ranges can range down into the mid 220s, so certainly into the average range here. And then, of course, these are the large specialties in internal medicine, pediatrics, uh, neurology, so forth. And again, the averages are going to be 210 to 220. The key thing to take away from this, you know, before people get too panicked, is that for the vast majority of us, regardless of what our step one score is, we're going to get into the specialty of our choice as long as it's one of those lesser competitive specialties like internal medicine, pediatrics, and so forth. I, for example, did internal medicine. So here you'll notice that even if you got a failing score on your step one, you still have a 90% probability matching to that specialty. Now if you're going into something like ENT or something like that, so then this is where you would fall. You would be falling on this light blue line. Unfortunately, uh, your chances really do dwindle if you do poor 
Corlinear learning step one. It's a flatter curve for the independent applicant, so that includes all the IMGs. It's, it's definitely there, but it appears that there's a bit less of a relationship kind of closer to this curve, and this is for the less competitive specialties. So it, it does have an impact and a bit more of an impact if you were a U.S. allopathic student. Let's look at the Step 2 data. Now, this is from the third edition. This is much more recent. I believe this came out uh, just last year. And so you can see, again, if you look at the peaks and valleys, if you look at the peaks, you'll see that, again, it's going to be tied to one of the fairly competitive specialties that we talked about earlier, like dermatology, diagnostic radiology, ortho, uh, otolaryngology, plastics. So you can kind of see the, the peaks here. You can see that the interquartile ranges seem to range a little bit more. You can kind of surmise that, you know, yeah, there is a relationship, but it's not quite as tight as with the U.S. only Step 1. And this is for the independent applicants. So this will be for for international medical graduates, whether you're U.S., uh, Canadian, or you were born overseas. And again, you're going to see the peaks, but again, there's, it's going to be a little bit more scattered. 